welcome to the Monday edition of DC Today. We are now into the middle of June. And of course, the second quarter and first half of the year will wrap up as we uh, complete these last few weeks. But it should be a little bit adventurous of a few weeks. We have the Fed meeting uh, starting tomorrow, Tuesday the 13th. And then they will make their announcement on Wednesday uh, the 14th of what the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, has decided to do for interest rates at this time. And we also will get on Wednesday, the month of May, uh, CPI, Consumer Price Index figure. Um, and we really won't have much else by way of company earnings. So kind of Fed-oriented and, and inflation, maybe just macroeconomic data may drive where things go. Now, when I say Fed, it's important to point out, and this is kind of the major comment I'll make today. I'll leave this one nice and short. Um, the Fed is widely expected on Wednesday to pause, to, to not move rates. Uh, you know, something in the range of a 75% implied probability in the futures market of no action this Wednesday, and yet still over a 60% probability of raising rates again next month in July. So the Fed will say something one way or the other on Wednesday of this week that gives markets some feel for where they are, and I expect that's what they will do. Now, that's not the same thing as saying it's what they will end up doing, meaning I expect they will talk Wednesday of this week as if they're going to raise rates next month and then wait and see market response and wait and see if some of the tightening gets done for them by jawboning uh, the, by utilizing forward guidance to try to affect a policy outcome. Uh, all, uh, that's not to say that I think it will reverse and that they won't end up raising in July. I generally do favor um, an expectation aligned with what the futures market is pricing, but the futures market itself is all over the map these days because the futures are themselves reflecting what are changing circumstances and changing expectations. So I think the uh, I would say that the majority view, but not overwhelming, is likely accurate that they will not raise rates this week and that they will raise rates a quarter point next July. But that will make for the third meeting in a row if they do. Well, not third in a row, but July with the pause in June with the May and April circumstances also, in my mind, indicating this of a rate hike against all evidence that that is the reasonable or appropriate thing to do. So we shall see uh, how that goes and, and what uh, ongoing inflation data and other economic particulars look like. The hard part of predicting it is I've been convinced for a very long time that they will go until they break something and then when they break something they will chicken out and push us back to another extreme, that they are committed to be in a monetary policy of extremes. Uh, a lot of years of excessive looseness now leading to this excessive tightness and that when the hangover comes of excessive tightness it will lead to a ping pong back the other way none of which i say complimentary as far as markets today the futures were pretty darn flat when they opened last night and stayed that way until my bedtime and we're still pretty uh flat uh at my early wake up but then a little bit before the market opened they started moving higher and the market did open um, uh, over 100 points to the upside. And it stayed there most of the day. There was a little dip at one point, not long. Uh, but it closed it near the high of the day, up 190 points. So you got over half a percentage point to the upside of the Dow. You got almost 1% in the S&P, and you got 1.5% in the NASDAQ. Technology being the best performing sector today, up over 2%. Energy being the worst, up down, uh, excuse me, down nearly 1%. Uh, bonds didn't move a lot. The 10-year was down one basis point on the day in its yield, so price is just barely up. Um, two just quick kind of investment-oriented comments. There are now less than 3,000 companies that are active and trading in U.S. public markets. There's still other public companies that aren't active, and there's still obviously a heck of a lot more globally but U.S. active, um, you're talking about 10,000 companies now that are backed by private equity and a little less than 3,000 that are actively traded in U.S. public markets. I think that's almost down by half, not quite. Um, and then you have 40,000 companies backed by venture capital. 
Uh, so you take all those numbers, those are often pretty sizable companies, impressive companies, and then you have 32 million small and mid-sized family businesses. That's really the predominant element of entrepreneurialism in the American economy. But for companies that have uh, sized themselves and scaled, uh, you, you are dealing with much less. Uh, but of course, the 3,000 public companies are often what the media will use as a bellwether of the U.S. economy. And there's some sense to it. They're larger. They employ a lot of people. But um, 32 million small businesses, I think, uh, if there were a way to index and aggregate data, would be a much more accurate bellwether. But of course, there isn't. And that very, uh, the, the disparities that exist in aggregating data and business intelligence for those um, that large dispersion makes it impossible. Hope that's of interest to you. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was this theme about M&A. Mergers and acquisitions in the financial sector was a big theme of ours coming out of COVID. And we really got, uh, I would say lucky, but we really had a lot of qualitative research that, is, that we caused, that caused us to assess things that way. Low rate environment, the post COVID moment. There was a lot of aggregation, consolidation, transactions taking place. And I think some of it was even sociological coming out of the COVID moment, pushed up uh, the values of investment banks that advise on these deals, of private equity firms, a lot of the private lenders that had a significant amount of deal flow, captured a lot of spread in that environment. Um, it, it was a good call on our part. Then you had in 22 interest rates go up a lot, um, a slowdown of that M&A activity. I believe we're probably at a point where now the M&A levels are, are about to bottom if they haven't already. And an, a new era of financial activity is worth paying attention to. So um, all that to say, the markets today were, were up. Uh, tech was the leader. Oil dropped over 4%. But I think that when you look at the rig count in the U.S., you have 63 less rigs operable right now than you did beginning of the year. Um, five weeks in a row now, soon to be six, it appears we've had a decline in operable rigs. That's the kind of thing that generally puts a bottom uh, in place, j unless you just get some real significant demand erosion as supply can't move all that much higher. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, we have uh, Ask David and Against, Doomsday Against Doomsdayism in our Monday edition of the DCToday.com. Check that out if you're interested, and I'll be back with you. Tomorrow, my partner Brian Seitel will be bringing you DC today on Wednesday as I'll be out of the office that afternoon. And other than that, pretty normal week ahead. Uh, you can think about it now, but um, next Monday, the 19th, there will not be a DC today uh, as markets are closed for what they call Juneteenth. Uh, so there you go. That's the uh, scoop in the DC today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And thank you for reading.